So the assignment is called update to February 23. And it should show up when you click today on assignments. And now it should show up when you go there, because now I click publish. So as soon as group one is ready, you can come up here. So click refresh. Oh, and look at that, group one's right there. You're good to go. Uh, watch out for all the tripping hazards that I put in, in the color in here. We dropped a crutch. My wife has not yet figured out how to use crutches. Yeah, and uh, it is pretty scary watching her trying to get around the house now with a broken ankle. That was like a yeah, that's. Yeah. I was lucky enough where I could like toe tap. I imagine with broken. Ankle. Yeah, she hasn't seen the surgeon yet, so she can't do anything. Oh. <laughs> but it's, it still has like the mute button in white, but that's okay, right? White is the color you want. Red okay. is yeah. bad. White good. Red bad. Sweet. Right. Red bad. All right, are people ready? Awesome. Yep. All right, so we're group one. Uh, we're gonna have some more updates about the wire EDM. So firstly, uh, I'm going to cover a couple questions that we got from question one. Uh, a few of these actually came up during the body of our presentation, but because people asked about them, we wanted to clarify them, restate some of them, go into some more detail. Uh, so one of the first ones we got was about wire materials. Someone was curious, like, what kind of options we'd have or if that's something that affects the cutting process. So that's not something that we've gone into a lot of research for because as far as we know from our conversation with Joel, um, for the wire EDM we have on campus, we only really have access to one like one wire and that's going to be good enough to cut any material we're going to use. But um, just from like a cursory search, uh, it would seem that there are a variety of options um, and kind of the things that you're balancing there are the precision of the cut versus the speed of the cut. So like uh, as far as what materials do that, that's not something that we've gone into depth for. It's not really a choice that we have available to us right now, but it's something we can look into further if people are curious about it. But, um, another one was about overcutting. So I mentioned that maybe too much as a passing remark, but um, the actual overcutting on a wire EDM, so how much more, like the, I guess the wire, if you want to think about it like a conventional machine, it basically has a kerf, right? It cuts more than what you would like literally just like on that point. Um, but for a given wire material, which we do know we have the one we're going to use, that is a thing that you can calculate. That is a, a known value. So you can always account for that and how you're machining the same way you might account for deflection with conventional machining or just the fact that there's thickness to your cutting tool. Um, but it is not, it's something that we will be accounting for in our actual canning process. And it's something that people who do wire EDM account for in all their operations. Um, for service finish, uh, someone was curious how the service finish of the parts machine this way would compare to conventional machining or other methods. Um, so for starters, uh, because you're actually cutting uh, you like a full depth of the cut uh, in the Z direction, like into the part or the, the stock every time, uh, that inherently is uh, a bit better than conventional machining, right? Like when you actually, every time you step down for conventional machining, you do have the potential for deflection there. Um, it's if you take like a surface metrology class here, that's the example that Shu and I went to because that was in a lecture we did where you can see the, the slight variation every time you step down. Uh, but for us, uh, that's one aspect of it. Um, if you actually look at the parts, it does look pretty clean. 
Um, but you also can do like a finishing pass in the same way as conventional machining for wire EDM. Um, whether that's something we're gonna need for the gears, we're still evaluating that, I think, but it's likely we will. Um, because we're making pretty small parts, that's not gonna add a ton to machining time. Um, and for angular cutting, uh, that was something we also mentioned, but uh, there's a nice visual on this slide, and then we also have a video, I believe, on the next slide of what that looks like. So, uh, and I guess you can't really see my cursor, but there's like the top and the bottom of the wire, right? Those, those are basically connected at two different like anchor points in those planes. So on a wire EDM, you have independent control of those. So there are a range of achievable angles. So in this one, you can see they're kind of cutting little steps. Um, and some like actual applications of that is uh, the, the videos that I've seen, um, for example, of people like cutting like a turbine for a, like an airplane, like the way that you would want to do that, right? A big steel angled cut is using this. For our own application, it's not something that's likely to come up. We considered like we wanted to make these like paired helical gears instead of spur gears that might be uh, an application for it, but uh, I don't think that's really within scope. It's not gonna be necessary for what we're doing, but it's an interesting application. Um, we have some, just some general other references on this slide. Uh, we were asked about what kind of like fit we're going to have. So using the machinist handbook, we called out the RC7 uh, for our like running and running fit as opposed to a sliding fit. Um, and then just like kind of a roughness measurement uh, you can see EDM is the third option up there, uh, as opposed to milling. It has like a much uh, narrower band of roughness uh, for surface roughness. Uh, if I just click this, will it show? Sure. Yeah. Insane tapered cut. Yeah. So <laughs> as far as like the tolerance, uh, this is like a part you guys may have seen. We mentioned that with the, uh, the, the snowflake last week. But uh, we thought it was kind of a cute little video. and the incredible tolerance they get, this is how, like what they're achieving, right? The, there's an angled cut on this, it appears like a taper. Um, maybe not as obvious as the example I had before. No, this one is just a great video to show like the actual machine in process underneath the water because a lot of the photos you see are just above the water and it's like doing its thing underneath. Um, and then this sort of so shows the, the sliding fit that um, that you can get with this machine. Sweet. So moving on, um, looking back at this past week, we had um, a couple challenges, the most of which being our stock preparation. Um, when we went into the machine shop, our spree licensing wasn't working, so we couldn't actually machine anything. Um, so instead, we tried using the vertical bandsaw to try and cut stock so that we could use um, or just prepare our stock. Um, as you can see in the image on the right, we didn't do an amazing job. Um, the right angle tool, you can see some of the gaps through it um, and that just shows that we're not perfect when we're doing it manually uh, and how difficult it was to cut straight. And Basically, we're cutting it in two inch. We're going to plan on cutting it in two inch by three inch chunks, um, just for fixturing in the machine, which I will talk about in a bit. So basically, um, in the image in the middle, you can sort of see how the clamp, clamping mechanisms can work on this machine. But we are planning to clamp it um, on the bottom of our bird piece, um, which are represented by the large squares. And we will be cutting at the very end of the three inches, uh, the two gears uh, in one go. And you just want to have that inch of distance between the clamp and where you're cutting just so you don't get anything. Um, and as we mentioned prior in our last presentation, we're going to be pre drilling a hole for the hex nut so that we can thread the wire through and then get that uh, hex nut for the other team. So some of our goals for this upcoming week, um, we are planning to order, or we have put in an order for our stock. Um, it's quarter inch, um, three inch by 72 inch, uh, 6061 aluminum. And we chose to go, after speaking with Joel, we decided to go with the quarter inch just so that we were wasting less material. Um, after we have our stock, we will be using the mini mill to pre-drill our holes and using the EDM to finally get a attempt at making our gears. And we made a haiku um, in our time together. We want to make gears, electronic dance music, oops, meant EDM. Thank you. Any questions?
what, what's your next step? Our next what? Your next step. Our next step. So once we, we're still waiting on our stock to come in um, from order, but basically once we get our I stock. I know the order was processed, so it's usually okay. a day. Okay, cool. So if it didn't um, come in yesterday, it's there today. Perfect. All right. Then we're planning to go into the shop and start um, prepping our stock, basically cutting off those three inch by two inch chunks from the, the overall piece and start milling and machining. Yeah. Um, oh. okay. All right. So I guess one thing I'm curious about. So as as you made clear, you have to obviously pre-drill the hole in order to cut out the hole. Mm -hmm. Um. So it, does that mean that you essentially have to like manually remove the thread from the machine and then like re-thread it through that hole? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We will probably need some help unless Shu knows how to do it. From Joe, I heard this machine kind of do it for you. It kind of cut it and thread it itself. Oh, okay. it, it's normal operation. Um, so, what's your what's your expected deliverable for next week? I think having two of the gears in hand and done, um, and then also now that we actually have access to a spree, we wanted to better document kind of our process. Uh, a lot of Shu has the most hands-on experience existing with that, and then Joel, so finding a way to synthesize that into some more like direct instructions for people to follow. Okay. The handbook on like, how to create the piece. Yeah. Anybody else? While you're right here, I have one comment on this last slide. Everybody knows at the end that it's okay to ask questions. Yeah. So as a style thing, I usually say something else. You know, thanks for your attention. Come back and see us next year. I'll be playing here all week. <laughs> uh, but I, so I would leave off the any questions because everybody knows. Although when you go to conferences, you'll see that everybody puts it there. Yeah. So. Don't feel bad. We'll stand out at our conference. Yeah, exactly. All right. If nobody else has questions, let's go with group two. Just go ahead and hit update up there in case they have. So we're group two, uh, injection molding. Oh, uh, you just. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, quick progress update. We talked to uh, Adam Sears, who is the uh, injection molding ex expert. And uh, overall, uh, our mold was pretty good, but he had some uh, recommendations for us to make, uh, some changes. Um, uh, in our original design, we had a, uh, a single locating feature around here, uh, which was just a pin that was machined. Uh, and he recommended to us that it would be a lot better to have uh, a pair of dowel pins with like a, a running fit. Um, so on one side of the mold, it's closed, and on the other side, it's open, so it can be easily removed. And uh, this makes it easier to machine and also easier to uh, keep the, uh, the clamp, clamshell together. And um, we also changed the orientation from, uh, it used to come through the top and now it's lengthwise. So this gives us easier sprue access and more room for the excess plastic to, to run off. And we also removed the ejector pins because this was, uh, he, he told us that it wasn't really necessary for a small volume uh, manufacturing such as this that's more at like the industrial level for high volume manufacturing and it would also save us a lot of time and uh, effort with the machining and we shared our files with group four and we began uh, computer aided manufacturing so uh one of the feedbacks that we got from last presentation is to give us give you more of a um uh, an insight into how the machine works uh so this is a, a plunger type injection molding uh this is um an automated one, but the principle is the same. Uh, so basically you have a feed hopper right here where you put your uh, your granulated plastic 
And then you operate a piston that pushes the plastic through the, uh, the barrel, which is heated, and that melts the plastic, which then goes through the nozzle and into the mold. So as you can see, uh, uh, we have our mold here. Uh, the plastic goes through the nozzle, through the sprue, uh, into the, the runner, which uh, goes to the, the gates. And then we don't have ejector pins, but pretty much once it's finished, you just open up the, the, uh, the mold and take the part out. So. For like, manual inj injection molding, you would make half of the, or little halves of the mold in advance, then the, find the materials that you're going to use, the, the temperatures, and I guess speeds of injection based on that, you pour your granulated plastic into the hopper, clamp the mold together, and clamp it in the vise. Pull the lever of the machine with a lot of force. Decent time. Let it cool. And you take it out of the mold. Do have the parts, and you just have to cut off the screw. So here's a, a short video. So yeah, the first thing you do is set the, the, the molding temperature using the uh, temperature controller on the machine. You add the plastic to the, uh, the hopper. As you can see, it also uses uh, dowel pins in the, uh, the mold and that gets clamped in the vise. And uh, actually, according to Adam Sears, this re really requires a lot of force to push down. So it's definitely not suited for high volume manufacturing. But for our purposes, it's fine. And then you can just pop the, the mold apart by hand. And uh, you don't really need vector pins, you can just, uh, like this guy, use just a flathead screwdriver to pop it out. And that's the, the finished part. That guy's making a pretty lame part. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <man. coughs> okay. okay, so we also had some uh, material considerations. Uh, so a big consideration uh, in injection molding is whether to use a thermoplastic or a thermoset. So uh, some of the advantages of thermoplastics is that they can be recycled and they have high impact and shrink resistance and high flexural strength. Um, whereas thermosets, really their main advantage is that they have a high temperature resistance, which isn't a concern for our part. Um, and they also, once they cure, they cannot be remolded or recycled. So it's really kind of one and done. Um, so to account for shrinkage, the shrinkage rate is given by the manufacturer and it depends on the material. So we have a formula here that we found that gives a good uh, approximation of the shrinkage, where S equals the shrinkage rate, M is the mold dimension, and F is the final dimension. So pretty much given the, uh, the shrinkage rate and the mold dimension, like uh, for example, it's fairly simple for us because it has a constant cross section throughout the part. And uh, we can just solve for the, uh, the mold dimension that would give us the final dimension that we require. And uh, the material that we use, we 
just found out is a uh, low density polyurethane, which has a uh, polyurethane, or I believe it's polyurethane, right? Um, which actually has a pretty high shrinkage rate range, which is between uh, two and four percent. And uh, we still need to look into uh, process temperature and also uh, pressure needed. And yeah, <laughs> we, <laughs> we have to check. <laughs> That's good. Um, yes. So in terms of the, uh, the shrinkage rate that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. so obviously you want it to be a press fit. So would that mean that like in your design, you're assuming the most shrinkage, so you're essentially oversizing it? Uh, most likely, I think we would oversize it because it's uh, polyurethane is kind of like a, a flexible thing. So it would be easier to press fit if, if it was just like a little bit bigger than the whole. Any other questions? What's your expected deliverable for next week? Uh, for next week, uh, we would like to have the, uh, the mold manufactured uh, and make some steps towards that. Uh, and also, we would really like to move the... Um, Adam Sears actually talked to us about moving the, uh, the uh, injection molding machine up from Unity into Washburn. Okay. That would give us a lot easier access to it. That that would take about seven minutes. Yeah. <laughs> In coordination with somebody that has a key. Yeah. When you went down to Unity, did you try the door? Was it locked? Yes, we tried it. It was locked. No. We can we can get access. Any other questions? <coughs> All right, I guess group three. Tab probably. That'll work. That works. All right. All right. So again, we're the fourth axis uh, lead group. So kind of our tasks for this upcoming week um, are to solidify the stock that we're using, and then also set cut path uh, parameters for the lathe. That mostly includes the Esprit program, and programming in that fourth axis. And then we have to continue to refine our lathe machining skills because we're all a little bit rusty. It's been a few years since ME1800. Um, that includes doing the tool offsets as well as the workpiece offsets so that that can get done quickly, easily, and be correct every time. Um, and then ultimately create the part and then create a very useful tutorial for all of you to follow. So a lot of the questions we got last week were what is the fourth axis in um, lathe turning. So the x axis is going into and out of the workpiece. That's your depth of cut. Y axis is kind of how far down um, you're moving on the workpiece, workpiece, kind of like your uh, chip formation. And then the piece or the workpiece spins along the z axis. And then the c is the rotation about the z axis controlled by the servo. Instead of just spinning at um, say 4,000 RPM the entire time. What we're planning on doing, we'll show you the CAD file in a second, but with that hex shaft, you don't have to spin it at 4,000 RPMs and then slowly cut away at it. This mill, uh, this lathe, I should say, has um, dynamic tools or rotating um, tools on it, so we can only turn it, say, 50 degrees at a time and cut off each um, hex face. Uh, so, progress on our CAD file. Uh, we added the lip at the bottom and fine the thread and changed around practically all the dimensions for both the end and the hex part of the center. And that's just a tentative merge with Group 1's gear file. We still have to communicate with them about exact tolerances because as of right now, 
you can see on the bottom right image, there's a very small gap between the walls, like the outer edges of our hex center and the inner minor diameter of their ear. But that's 0 0.01 inches, which is a quarter of a millimeter. And I'm not sure if that's viable at the current moment. I would mean, just love to check about that. So one of the main things that we did this past week, um, just like physically in the lab, was we went into the job. I think one of the main issues we were having is that the machine in the lathe is like so large, and we're only doing that max of the one inch diameter saw. So one of the main parts is adjusting the chunk to make sure that it's gripping the thing correctly and is holding in place. Um, and so one of the things that did take a while was just even just adjusting the chunk individual jaws. So you can see this bottom one is in the correct position, and these top ones are in how we found it. So if necessary. Guys, go and machine your part. If they're in one of the these top two positions, um, and you want to get to the bottom, it's um, obviously do the steps kind of same steps that any lathe, but making sure that all the jaws are at the exact same distance. You can kind of see here there's like eight of these sticking out, so that was what we found was the best way to get there so that there is that um, perfect like one inch diameter fit inside the middle, um, and then towards the edges of the top or 79 foot pounds, just to make sure that. It's um, held in securely and in the same position. And um, lastly, I'd say our expected deliverable for next week, if we can get it next week, is obviously to try to match with team one and say if they're making two years, I'm going to try to make two shafts to match with that. If our design is approved for and, and given the go ahead for creation. Yeah, that's all. Um, did you say you had a CAD CAD design for the part? Is that on a previous slide? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> you need feedback on that. Sorry, I should have. So should have the, no, no, I'm just. I so I think the threads have to come down all the way to the top edge of the gear otherwise the gear will ride up and down on the shaft so i think the, the hex part needs to shorten yeah okay well, so, sorry i was just i was just yeah no, I, i'm just i'm just putting it exactly in the center so that with, with this lip and that yep. that's the same uh, yeah i'm just thinking of the little thumb screws that i purchased to screw on the top <laughs> right and so you you certainly could design a cap that would use that would work here, but no, 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 the one that I the one that I bought wouldn't work. Yeah. So if you if you get that hex to be down, okay. probably the thread needs to be almost all the way to where the top edge of the gear is. So okay. just make the hex shorter and have yeah, the thread go to the end. And so also on on any threaded thing where you're going to use the fastener to tighten down to the bottom of the thread, yeah. you need to put a relief. So you need to put a little divot, basically, beyond the threads. Right. So if I do this without knocking everything over. So right here, without taking the cap off the marker, you'd want to have a little relief so that the diameter after the threads is a little bit smaller than the root diameter of the thread so that way the fastener can screw past the end of the last thread so it would be like it was coming off the other end if it was like just a threaded rod and so if you put so just shorten this and just put a little relief at the bottom then that nut will screw all the way down and it will hold the uh the gear in place right See that skill of not taking the cap off the marker? So the length of the bottom part that fits into the bearing, is that the exact size of the bearing? I think that's going to press fit into it. Is just slightly longer or shorter? Uh, well, that's the other thing we need to coordinate. Um, right now, it's just the exact same dimensions as the bearing. So that's not accurate. Let me just put our file up in the discussions for Canvas. Get the, so you guys can look at the file yourself, but also the file that you can ask for this. The tolerance is okay. And then uh, for group 
uh, fours file. There's the bearings right in there if you guys want to check the dimensions because there's not much clearance at all beyond the bearing. Is it probably okay. like beyond the bearing? Yeah, of course. It's just kind of. We can, we can fix it right now. For next, yes. for next week, we'll probably have another tentative assembly with both the gear and the bearing, just so you guys can see it. Okay. Yeah. While we're doing dimensioning discussion, is like the rounded part that's between the X and then the nub that sticks to the bearing, is that like sized appropriately that it doesn't like ride on the base of the bearing? Like, do you know where that's going to sit? Uh, or I guess maybe it doesn't matter for the type of bearing you're going to use. Is that, is that a concern? Like, if it, if it rides on the rest of it, but not yeah. the external ones, is it going to rub? Presently, it would rest. That is the problem. Okay. I, th I think, I mean, again, I don't know the exact type of bearing myself either. I should know that, but no. Um, but we'll look at your file, and then we'll see if that is an issue. And if it is, we'll work something out. We'll change the, we'll change the shape. Yeah, so with your making a couple parts... I would go ahead with that plan, even if there's going to be design changes, because once you've done the process of making the part, it's easy to update the design and make another part. Right. So I wouldn't. So so definitely, let's work out those answering those questions, but don't let it keep you from doing the next step. Yeah, we go. So the tolerance, I think we showed you the second slide on our presentation today. So it's Sorry. RC seven. Does that mean you are two thousandths to four thousandths down? Okay. There should be a gap, otherwise you won't. You will be a no, no, no. I know that. I'm just. Yeah. I was just wondering. Uh, is our is our gap at present? Is that okay? no? It's too small. You just yeah. I fi I, I figured that it was. So. Also, just follow, will you be a chamfer on the press fit? Because in my experience, it's time for make it easier to build. So, um, yeah. So at the end that you're going to push into yep. the bearing, yeah. This he's the other end. Yeah, he's thinking maybe put a chamfer on there. There's um, there's a couple other things. So we should <coughs> we should be to talk about that because there's a couple other ways to make it easier to assemble that press fit at the end. Uh, when can we do that? Um, if we finish this class early, right after this. Okay. If we don't finish this class early, then sometime later today or tomorrow. Okay. Sounds good. That's all, all right. Group four. Last year we did this with five groups and people had to rush to get through. Really? Four groups is way better. It gives us like like one presentation cushion. Yeah. Um, so this is our, our update from last week. Uh, so to begin with, uh, it felt like uh, last week people weren't exactly clear on how we were going to be using the fourth axis. Um, so now with better visuals than just drawings on piece of paper. We're going to try to re-clarify that as best as possible. Um, so this is actually a model we found online of the exact fourth axis piece that is being used in the lab. Uh, this is sort of the base of the mill, uh, and this is the fixture plate. The fixture plate attaches to the mill, and then the fourth axis attaches to the fixture plate. Uh, and then we made the uh, stock glue just for visual clarity. So it loads into the fourth axis like that. Uh, this red arrow is the axis that it rotates around. Um, and the general idea is uh, sort of plate style. You can essentially machine it down. Uh, this is the shape of our part uh, before it gets cut off from the rest of the stock. Uh, zooming in a little bit just to make it clear. Uh, so again, the main advantage of the fourth axis is that you can uh, do much milling operations while it rotates about this axis into the page. Um, so as of right now, the text is written on a flat surface, but we could, in, in theory, make it wrap around these curved edges, which you wouldn't be able to do uh, on a normal lathe. Uh, extra operations like that just make it slightly easier to machine a part like this. Um, and then obviously, these holes would be machined after removing it from the fourth axis, but yeah. 
Um, next is the big update, the fixture plate. Uh, originally, the plan was we were going to design a custom fix fixture plate. Um, and then uh, Rodrigo, who was sort of guiding us through this whole process, uh, came to the conclusion that it would be uh, easier, faster, and probably better to just get uh, a professionally designed uh, plate in from Haas. Uh, so this is the model that uh, has been purchased. I believe it's due to arrive tomorrow. Uh, so these are, these are the dimensions. It fits pretty nicely into the plate. And uh, so again, the, the main purpose of it is that instead of having to go through a long, laborious process of hooking the fourth axis directly into the mill, you can sort of leave it on this plate, and the plate is designed to be as easy to attach and detach from the mill as possible. Um, and so the fact that we're buying it is nice for all the reasons you mentioned, um, but it, uh, it does also mean that a lot of the work that we did over the past week in designing a plate is kind of irrelevant now. So, um, yeah. Cool. All right. So some updates to our design. We have four holes in the bottom now instead because of the injection molding group. And they have uh, two uh, mounts here. And we have a, just tweaked some of the measurements to make it fit into the uh, four axis piece a little better. Um, but other than that, the design stayed relatively the same, just tweaking some dimensions. And uh, for possible concerns, uh, bearing press uh, part length from group three was the biggest concern and we are still unsure as to what we're going to do for putting text onto it what phrase or words we're going to use uh, as you can see here uh, 0.05 inches is the amount of distance between the bottom of the bearing and the uh the metal itself uh, so that's not much of a of room for a shaft to uh be in, i guess put in and then you know, bottom out. So, yeah, that's pretty much all we have today. It's <laughs> <laughs> nice to have a touch. Um, questions from the group? As, as of right now, our end to ends, uh, like the unpredictable. Right. Okay. But we could make it longer. Yeah, I th I think if anything, it might need to become shorter. Again, just depending on how the exactly the press fit into the bearing works. Um, because yeah. So if I understand it correctly, you're going to do the outer run on the fourth axis, you're going to cut it off, mm -hmm. go down the normal, yeah. and do the, the whole top and bottom. Exactly, yeah. So where's the zero on the the, the last two operations? Where's the origin? I would understand the origin. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand. So when you do the top and bottom, yeah. uh, how do you set the origin? Where do you set the origin? Just oh, uh, good point. Um, I guess we hadn't thought about that. <laughs> because I'm just thinking, if you have two turn part, if you, it's kind of hard to, I mean, you can do it, but. Yeah. Um, it's gonna be a little tricky though, you're right. Yeah. I Thank guess, you. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> we, we were mostly thinking about the fourth axis, so I guess we hadn't considered. Yeah, All right. we hadn't gotten to those intermediate steps yet. <laughs> so yeah, it's a good thing to, that we should think about. Thank you. Also generally, if you have a chance for all the press visual inside the Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. I actually have a, a few thoughts too. But you guys can go sit down. Um, uh, screen up, right? Room control, screen up. Okay. Okay. Um, great erase bold. That doesn't look very bold. We'll go with it. Okay. So on the, um, on those like slip fits and press fits. So you guys decided RC7. Yes. Why? Uh, I think it's because according to Mr. I'm not saying it's wrong. Right. I want to hear the right I'm now. just looking through the handboard. I think that's for a smooth fit to assemble. That's why I chose okay. it. Okay. 
Yeah, so that RC7, and so what he's referring to is a standardized way of characterizing how loose or how something fits. Um, and you can look it up in the machinery's handbook. I have done, I don't know, what's 17 types here? 34. 34 times I've done a lecture that explained how to, to look it up in the machine it's the handbook. And many of those are on YouTube. So if you Google it, you might be able to find that too. Um, but yeah, I think the RC7 is probably a good fit. Now the, the tolerance or the, the allowance that you want to have. So the allowance is the gap between the small thing and the big thing. And um, it's the allowance that you want to have. It depends on what the diameter of the part is. So you use like three eighths of your diameter when you came up with the tolerance. This group. You use it's because you have to adjust for the diameter of the part. Yes. So you're you're saying that they need to be two to four thou under. Yeah, so for us it's like zero to two thousand up, but for them it's two thousand to four thousand under. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So that's easy enough to adjust on your yeah. on your part. Yeah. Was it two to four thousand or twenty to four? Two to four, two to four probably. Two to four? Okay. Yeah. Twenty to forty and the thing would be falling over. Yeah. Even even four thou is pretty pretty loose, pretty pretty jiggly. Uh, all right, so what we do yeah. In that case, are we worried about I am not worried because of the operating forces that it's going to say. Yeah. But but yeah, if if you were going to be high force, lots of vibration, something like that, you'd want to have a tighter fit on that so there wouldn't be as much motion. But I'm thinking with our little hand fidget toy, out, we don't need to worry about it. Um, all right. So on the tolerances, when when you're designing one of these press fit things especially press fits for bearings who, who's ever pressed a bearing into something just one oh about half of us have who's ever destroyed the bearing while pressing it into something most of the hands should probably stay up right and it's it's very easy to screw this up and the, the process so if we had if we had the sort of the, the bearing is here so what's the bearing's gonna look like this, right? So there's the outer race, maybe there's the inner race, right? So it's got a hole in the center, it's got the balls, it's got the outer race. When it comes, and so when this gets pressed down into a hole, the hole's gonna be here, right? So it's gonna get pressed down into that hole. The hole has to be smaller than the outside of the bearing in order for it to be a press fit. If it's too much smaller, you just jam those bearings together and they can't rotate it. Or you just, you can't, you can't move it um, when you're doing it. The other thing that you've got to think about is when I'm going to press this bearing down into here, I need to press on this outer race surface. If I press on anything else, if I press on the inner race, surface i'm going to try to push the balls out of the race as i'm pushing it down and it's going to make it dense in there when i do that you're going to plastically deform it and then when you let go the little dents are still going to be there and when you spin it you're going to feel click 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 every time the bearing goes around so that makes it tough the other thing that makes it tough is if we misalign the hole and the bearing or we misalign the tool we're using to press down on the bearing it's because this is what's the thickness of of the bearing like a hundred thou I, I remember looking at it it's, it's around an eighth of an inch probably what's that point two so two hundred thousand Right, so this dimension is, is less than a quarter of an inch. And if, if you use chamfers, here's the problem with chamfers. 
if I've got my part here, I'm not saying don't do a chamfer. I'm just saying here's the problem with the chamfer. So there is some sort of a chamfer or fillet on the bottom of the bearing, I'm sure, just from the manufacturing of it. And and then I've got the hole that it's going into, so that's going to have a, a chamfer like that, right? And it's smaller. If this side touches a little bit before this side, it's going to be very easy with our big arbor press to jam it sideways and to put it in crooked, which is going to add to all the problems of crushing the bearing. There's a trick. A trick taught to me by an old, a cranky old machinist, but I guess I had made him happy enough by serving him beer that he was less cranky. So, um, so the chamfer is nice because it keeps from having sharp edges. edges. It keeps from having a bird that rolls in there, which is also going to be a problem. So you might want to have the chamfer, but if for a little ways, maybe make the chamfer small. And then for a little ways, you make it be a subfit. And then make it be your press fit dimension. So you actually sort of line it up in the slip fit before you start pressing. And this helps a lot with alleviating the crookediness. And so you do that the same thing with the shaft. If you make a little bit of it be a slip fit and then be the, the press fit. So you don't get the you know you don't get the pressure across the whole width. But um, it makes it much easier to do the assembly part if you don't have fancy assembly jigs. <clears throat> so it pays to buy beer for cranky old machinists, and they teach you tricks. Because uh, I did not read that in the machinery's handbook. Cranky old machinist on that one. Um, here's the, the other thing. All right. It's still on bearings. In order to press the bearing into the base part, we need to press on the outer race. In order to press the shaft into the bearing, so let's say the order of operations. And so order of operations for this assembly is gonna be important. If we put the bearing in the base first, then we have to support the uh, the center race when we push the shaft in. If we put the bearing on the shaft first, then we have to push down on the outer race, which is going to be covered up by the gear. Is it? We can put the gear after we put it in. Okay, so we got we got to consider this order of operations. So then the lip on the shaft has to allow us to put a tool over the outside of it to touch the outer race, right? So it, but it only has to be big enough so that the gear doesn't fall down, right? Okay, so those are some design considerations that came out and just in my mind in looking at these things. So I would I would recommend and so the group that I was going to talk to after about the the aligning of stuff, that was what I wanted to talk about after. So we've done that. Um I guess we'd have to ask uh what's their other diameter? Yeah, the is the drawing of the bearing in the, the discussion thing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so it's it's in the discussion there's a drawing there. Um, and because you guys track the bearing, right? Yeah. yeah. So if you also add to that just a link to the specification so people can look up the tolerances and stuff, that'd be that'd be good. Um, all right. So my last thought was on the fourth axis group. So your fourth <laughs> axis operation is going to be oh, so your stock material is what they were. Um, I believe we were told the maximum is like one inch. 
the max diameter that you can hold in the chuck right. is one inch. Yeah. Um, you can do a larger diameter part as long as you turn part of it down to one inch hold in the chuck. Um, and so, but, but, so that aside, because it didn't, it didn't look like you were showing that in your picture. Right. That was why I was going to ask that to make sure you knew, knew about the one inch on the on red shop. Um, so you've got the tool here, right? And that's in the spindle up here. And you, so we're looking head on to the part. You've got your round part here. And so you were going to maybe face it off or do something to make, make, make it look, look more, more like, like this. this. So, right. that, so that after the, after the first operation, the part looks like that maybe. Right. And then after the second operation, the part looks like this. And then you were going to do a moving you get to just have the tool sit there and have the part rotate to make this radius. I'm trying to envision how you would make that shape in the configuration you were showing in your picture. Right. Um, and then the, the important parts of the piece are here and on the opposite side yeah so to make this part with inch and a quarter diameter stock let's step through the process the steps is you've got to take your inch and a quarter stock put it in a lathe and make part of it one inch so you can hold it in the truck and cut it off then you got to put it in the fourth axis and you do operations in one setup then you've got to take it out of the fourth axis put it back in a lathe to your cutoff to separate the piece that you want from the stock that you have Could you not cut it off? what tool are you going to use <laughs> so i would say you can cut it off in the mill um you could plow through it with a Two inch end that one, cut it off, right? <laughs> um, but you're gonna have, I mean, so for, to do that cut off, you're gonna have a big curve, right? Right? Um, by by cutting it off in the mill with a milling tool, or you could use a right angle tool holder, right. and you could put a slitting saw in a right angle tool holder and cut it off in the mill. We don't own a right angle. Right angle to a holder that would hold the slings off. Um, so you're not going to do that here. <laughs> you could put it in the fifth axis and rotate it up and use the slings on a regular holder. But we got the fixture for the fourth axis. Yep. Cut it off using the lathe. Yeah, but you got to take it out of the. I'm talking about the steps, right? Yeah. We put it in the lathe. We put it in the mill. We put it back in the lathe. We put it in the mill. We flip it over. Put it back in the mill. There's a lot of in and out of the machine. Yeah. The reason we wanted to use the fourth axis was to minimize the number of setups. Right. So I'm wondering if a different orientation or even a different shape would be right. more suited to the the goal. Um, I'm just I'm just thinking. Yeah. Right. So if if the part if the tool was here. And the part was coming out like this. And you were making a shape on it, rotating it, making a shape on it, rotating it, making a shape on it. There's still that whole idea of how do you cut it off, I suppose. But here, you could make a part, make a shape at this piece put, rotate it, put the holes in, rotate it, put the holes in, and you might even be able to make it out of one inch stock and avoid the initial setup. Uh, I don't I don't know if it fits that way or not, but you might be able to make it out of the one inch stock 
to avoid the setup. Yep. So the angle of the peak is a curve on the side, right? That's what yeah, you can change that design too. Just like a block. Well, it's still it's still gonna have to go in the lathe, in the mill, in the lathe. My thought for the fourth axis was since there was holes from two different sides, you could make all that in one setup. Right. Yeah. Which you can't do with the way you've designed it. Right. Um. So. But if you, but if you, yeah, so it's and it's just like feedback, right? I think it's more steps the way you've the way you've designed it, decided to do the operation. Right. Yeah. Better off orienting it so that the uh, big flat sides are um, parallel to the uh, table of the mill itself. That's what I was thinking. Okay. Right. So if you make and so you could still actually get this shape on one yeah. end. Yeah. Um, by doing a, a three-axis operation as you rotate it, right? So you could you could make that hemisphere shape on one end. Um, yeah. So this is just some thoughts. Yeah. Um, and I think you know if if we do it exactly the way you've shown it already, which is documented, that's how we did it. Right. Because right? purpose is to learn how to set up and use the fourth axis. The purpose isn't to make the most efficient program. Right. Yeah. So, um, did I have any other thoughts? I don't think so. Yeah. Um, general feedback for everybody. Much better presentations. Everybody was answering questions that people posed. So that means we're looking at the feedback. I like that. Um, I like the, the touch for the groups that had videos showing what the process looked like. Um, oh, I didn't have one more thought. Injection molding group. The, the video you had, was that from a company that sells injection molding machines or that sells injection molded parts? That's what I thought too. Um, there are some companies that do short production run, sort of prototype injection molding runs where they use aluminum molds and stuff like we're talking about. As an extra thing, if you reach out to one of those companies and say, hey, we're doing this class project, so we're not going to buy the parts, but we would like to know how much would it cost if we did want to buy the parts. Um, uh, what's Proto Labs? Is one of the businesses that does that. They do short run production stuff. They get a web page. You can go to their web page. And so I wouldn't lead on like we're going to go buy a bunch of parts, but it would be interesting to find out what the cost would be if you gave them your part design and said, we want to have 50 or 500 or whatever. Make it out of what? SLA. SLA. Um, maybe. I don't know about the melting temperatures and the, the temperature of the stuff going in, but 3D print the mold, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think people do that. I don't, I don't know. That'd be, a, that'd be a cool experiment for you guys. Because then you can change the part quickly, but you're going to be stuck with the surface finish that you had from the SLA print. So, yeah, that's, that's a cool idea. Um, yeah, so that was my one thought when you guys were presenting was it'd be interesting to find out how much somebody would charge for this part. Oh, everybody's got a part that they've designed, right? And yeah, okay. Um, for everybody that's not doing injection molded parts, find out how much zometry would charge you to make your part. Because they, they have a just a web page, you put up your design, they give you a price back. So that's that's they've got a computer algorithm doing that. So I wouldn't I wouldn't feel bad to make their computer do some work. <laughs> so it'd be kind of cool. So as the as an update for part of next week's presentation, everybody should have some idea of what the cost would be if you outsource this. And just an idea. It have to be an exact price. All right, perfect. We'll see everybody on we have class on Tuesday, right? Monday, 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 Monday. Yeah. Okay. See you all Monday. Sorry. <laughs>
Yeah. 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 Yeah.